Um, yes, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, you're you're fine. All right. Um, if 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 I just mute myself and just kind of, you know, kind of keep an eye on the recording and stuff, you can advance the slides, and and you'll just kind of watch the time. So you do about so it's about you know nine thirty two your time. So I'm looking that if we can get about forty five minutes worth of a presentation, you know that should be enough. That'll be um, just fine. Or, or do you want me? You want me to um, let you know, when, you know, at, at the half hour mark or something, or the forty minute mark? I, um, I mean, the, what, the what forty you minute mark would be just fine. Okay. All right. So. So, so if you want to, just, you know, in, in a moment here. Uh, Oops. Okay. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm muting myself right now. This presentation is about Windows technical preview of Windows 10. And um, I welcome uh, email responses. So please get my email down if you would like to co communicate with me about Windows 10 or about this presentation. Um, I belong to the Tucson Computer Society. And most of my volunteer work is now done for uh, APCUG. All the file, the presentation file for this presentation is located at the website of the Tucson Computer Society, which is a z t c s dot o r g. Just click on meeting notes. Repeat. That's a z t c s dot o r g. At the top of the meeting notes page, you will find. This presentation, which is actually a brief combination of three, three additional presentations. So this is the shorter version. And if you want more details about how to install and use uh, Windows uh, Technical Preview, or if you want more details about the um, key logging that Microsoft is doing, or even or more details about the features in this new version of Windows, please look at the more detailed presentations that are at the top of this page. Then a quick summary. The first preview of Windows 10 was released on October 1, 2014. It is called the Windows Technical Preview. Microsoft will probably quit emphasizing the numbering on different versions of Windows from here on out. The Windows Technical Preview comes in two editions. Both are free, but be aware that both expire in, in the middle of the day on April 15, 2015. There are four ways for you to try out the Windows Technical Preview. The topics we will cover is uh, are what is the Windows Technical Preview, key logging and data collection by Microsoft, uh, system requirements, hardware requirements, uh, differences between the Windows Technical Preview Edition and the Windo Windows Technical Preview for Enterprise, how to download the Windows Technical Preview, five ways to try it out, installing new builds into a copy of Windows Technical Preview, and finally, features of the Windows Technical Preview. What is it? It's a free, time-limited operating system that gives us a look into the developing future of Windows, which is going to be called Windows 10. And as Microsoft develops these various builds, some of the builds will be every two or three weeks shoved out to a, all the copies of Windows Technical Preview so you can see exactly what they have developed at any given point in time for the next year or so. Uh, there are two preview editions of Windows 10. They were both released on April, <laughs> on October 1st. October 1st. Uh, one is called the Windows Technical Preview and one is called Windows Technical Preview for Enterprise. 
all that t really tells you is there will probably be at least two versions of the final product sometime next year. Both of them look like this. And those of you who are familiar with Windows 7 will find this very comfortable. The Start menu and the Start menu button are back at the lower left-hand corner. This is the notification area, also known by some as the system tray, is back and hasn't really changed even during Windows 8 and 8.1. And as you expect from Windows 7, there isn't much going on in the desktop. You have to create that yourself by putting shortcuts and other things there. All you find there is the recycle bin and a welcome uh, shortcut to a welcome page. In the lower left hand, in the lower right hand corner of Windows Technical Preview, you'll see this indication of exactly what your operating system you're running. It's build number 9841. If you were to put in the enterprise version, all it does is it's also build 9841, and it says it's for enterprise. So let's see. On the lower left-hand corner, you start off with a slanted white window that is transferred over from Windows 8 and 8.1. And you'll see a global search button. And then you'll see a task view button. That's new. And say, so is the global search button. They're both new. Then you'll have the familiar Windows uh, Internet Explorer shortcut. which, And then you'll have File Explorer, also which used to be called Windows Explorer. Then you'll have a shortcut to Store, also known as Windows Store. So for this presentation, if, I, if it says Windows Technical Preview, that's the edition we're talking about. If it says Windows Technical Preview for Enterprise, that's the other edition. If we put in two uh, dots, like the, the case in the bottom, Windows Technical Preview dot dot, it means the above two editions and or. Okay. Uh, let's look at it quickly at the timeline. If you're always asking about what kind of timing is going to be involved for Windows 10. Windows 10, the two versions came out of the Windows Technical Preview. They're both free on October 1st. Sometime around February 2015, maybe as late as March, they're going to come out and release the free Windows Consumer Preview. Then in April of, uh, of 15 of 2015, both the Windows Technical Preview and the Windows Technical Preview for Enterprise will expire and start shutting you down every hour and turning black. So you won't want to run the Windows Technical Preview any later after about the middle of the day on April 15th, 2015. In May 2015, plus or minus a month, we're going to get the Windows Release Preview of Windows 10, um, which will also be free. That will be final, their final free version, and other than the enterprise versions, which they always maintain uh, free previews. And finally, sometime in August or September, they will release the release to manufacturing version to their partners. The partners are those who build computers. This is not going to be free. This will be the OEM version, and in some cases, the non-OEM retail version that computer builders install into their computers. And they need about a month or so of lag time, lead time, before the actual, they actually ship a product. Finally, or somewhere around October, they have to meet the deadline of about the end of October, or probably about the middle, in order to get Windows 10 onto the Christmas, the computers that are sold during the holiday season. Sometime around October, they will have a retail generally available, they call it GA, production of Windows 10. It may be as early as September. So key logging. When you install the Windows Technical Preview, 
Microsoft makes you read a end user license agreement. They just call it a license agreement. And in there, they tell you to go to the below mentioned uh, a hyperlink. In there, and it's a little hard to see, they say that, and it's this, there's very fine print, they say that they will, um, when you enter text, they have the right to collect the characters, that's also known as key logging, and use them for purposes of improving Windows 10. That means that they will store your keystrokes in their servers somewhere in their server farm data center system. So there, that has caused a lot of consternation. This is the first version of Windows uh, that they've ever done that to and been very, very uh, upfront and open about. So then the question is, what can, what should you do about the fact that they are going to log and s collect your keystrokes and store them somewhere for analysis. Well, most people are saying that you probably shouldn't do secure web access, anything involving passwords and, se and secure uh, online purchases, access to secure bank accounts, brokers, that sort of thing, while Microsoft is uh, storing your keystrokes somewhere. It's just not a good practice. Um, we haven't had any real security issues with Microsoft's uh, storage of people's keystrokes ever, and they've had extremely bulletproof security amongst the administrators of their websites. So there isn't much to really worry about, but it has caused some consternation. For example, obviously you're not going to use this operating system and violate various rules regarding people's privacy if you're a doctor or a lawyer or anybody that's involved with the payment card industry like a retail store. These kind of places have to have an operating system that they totally control and where they know where the keystrokes are going. So anyhow, um, the other thing that I generally tell people to do is when they evaluate something, they really need to put at least two routers and a demilitarized zone for the upper router and the lower router is where you put your important assets and I have a presentation about that also. Finally, system requirements. They, uh, the system requirements are the same as the later version of Windows 8.1. So it, there's no surprises here other than the fact that it will not run except for in 10% of the Pentium 4s that are out there, only the later two years or so of Pentium 4s. The RAM requirements are going to be the same as 8.1, 1 gigabytes for a 32-bit and 2 gigabytes for the rest of us. Free hard drive space has been shrunk down to 16 gigabytes. I've actually installed it there into a very small hard drive. Things ran a little tight and there was it was very slow because Windows didn't have any room for caching and thinking on the hard drive. So and then the a graphics card is the same for, as Windows 8.1. Finally, Microsoft states on their website that you have to have a Microsoft account and internet access. Okay, I would tend to agree with internet access, but I've decided to put a, an X across a Microsoft account because that isn't quite true. You have to have internet access in order to download the installation file which is, for most of you, an ISO file, which is an image of a DVD in order to install Windows Technical Preview. But first of all, you can get Windows Technical Preview without having a Microsoft account, even though that's not the official way that Microsoft tells you to do it. Um, so we'll go into that a little while later. In the meantime, what are the differences between the Windows Technical Preview and the Windows Technical Preview for Enterprise? These five items are the differences. Uh, is it five items? One, two, three, four, six items. Five, six, six items. And the bottom six items of the six items are server um, uh, capabilities, features, server-related features for businesses. 
So the only thing that really concerns you will be Windows to Go, which is the topmost capability, which is the ability to make a bootable hard drive, which you can do with Windows Technical Preview for Enterprise. So we'll talk about, I actually have a complete presentation about how you can make a bootable hard drive to boot up other computers from inside the Windows Technical Preview for Enterprise. That's an interesting way to try out Windows Technical Preview. But, okay, the first way, then the ways to download the Windows Technical Preview, there are two ways that to download it. First of all, you, there's a direct download link. You don't have to log in with any Microsoft account. You click on it and it downloads. Second of all, this is not the official way for you to get, get it. Second of all, if you go to, the method two is to go to preview.windows.com, sign in with your Microsoft account, join the Microsoft Insider program, then you can download the ISO file for installing Windows Technical Preview. For that, the way that when you do it the second way, obviously they're going to have an, a knowledge that you, you've obtained it and they can send you some emails whether you want them or not. Some people call them marketing emails to notify you of changes and other information about the Windows Technical Preview. So there are good, good things and bad things about joining the uh, Microsoft Insider program. For most of us though, the method one, just click on a button uh, on a URL and it downloads is probably the preferred way to get it. And I, I go over a tremendous amount of details in my uh, using Windows uh, technical preview presentation, which is uh, on my website, but I don't go into any real details in this particular version of the presentation. Second of all, I've got a quick warning for you. Um, if you're using a Windows 7 computer to download to, and you join the um, Windows Insider program, so those are the two things that happen. You have to have a Windows 7 computer and you're using it to join the Windows Insider program, which is method two for downloading. Do not click on the Start Upgrade Now button. Do not use this button. If you do use this button, you, um, you will end up being f with Windows Update attempting to force you to, ins to upgrade the computer you're currently on to Windows Technical Preview and there's no going back. Instead, if you scroll downward in the same page where you see this button, you'll end up at, at a bunch of download links like the rest of us and you'll be able to download it without being forced to install it into the computer you're using for downloading. So anyhow, I've got more screenshots and all that. Um, what happens is if you don't, if you click on the um, uh, update button, start upgrade now button, you end up with the update sitting inside Windows Update as a mandatory required update to your copy of Windows 7. That may cause some problems for some of us, especially if you want to keep your copy of Windows 7. It, there's no going back once you click on install. So that's just a quick warning, okay? This, here are the four ways, and we won't go into any, any details, to try the Windows Technical Preview. But there's Five ways. Okay, I've changed it to five ways. Actually, there's about six. I'll explain that in a minute. There is the, you can install it into a physical real computer. You can install it into a virtual machine running inside an existing computer. You can install it to dual boot with, a, with it being installed into a VHDX file or a VHD file running inside Windows 7, 8, or 8.1. So you can dual boot without creating a partition for it. You can dual boot by installing it into a separate hard drive partition. That involves shrinking your copy of Windows 7's partition or Windows 8 or 8.1 to make room, making a new partition using Windows 7, 8 or 8.1. And then finally, installing in such a way as the operating system where goes, uh, Windows Technical Preview goes into the new partition. Finally, there's this Windows to go thing where you can create a bootable hard drive, external hard drive or flash drive, thumb drive, that runs, attaches to an, exist, an existing computer using USB 
two or three, and then you can use this external device to boot up your existing computer and your internal hard drives are not at all affected. So, and then with method one, which is using a physical computer, you have the choice of disconnecting your current hard drive and connecting another hard drive, right? So, or you, have, you can use a drive swapping tray system, which is expensive and they're not too reliable, but a lot of people use them. So what else can I tell you about? Let me see here. Let's go here. Okay, if you use install it to dual boot method three or four, you end up at this when you boot up when you power up your computer with these a menu like this, and you pick what you want. In this case, I have installed into this computer a copy of Windows Technical Preview, uh, and a co and it already had a copy of Windows 8.1. So when it starts up, I have a choice. I can either have Microsoft log my keystrokes and learn about Windows, the future of Windows 10, or I can go to this good old safe old Windows 8.1. So once, this is a quick diagram of what you're doing when you boot up with an external Windows to go hard drive. You just attach it to any existing computer that's capable of running Windows 10, and you start it up, and you make sure that the BIOS finds the hard drive first, the external hard drive, and you run Windows uh, Technical Preview instead of your regular operating system. When you disconnect the USB drive or device and you boot up your computer, you're back to your normal internal hard drive. Features of the Windows Technical Preview. Okay, this is the part I want to spend the most time on and because it is of the greatest interest to people that I, I discuss Windows Technical Preview with. And so we're going to go over the main features real quickly here. Resurrected start menu. Everybody's been crying about there's no start menu in Windows 8 and 8.1. Uh, Windows Store apps, which which were available in Windows 8 and 8.1 in the um, uh, start screen, now run inside the desktop as uh, resizable Windows. Windows Store apps are also known as modern apps and universal apps. Uh, task view and multiple desktops is new in Windows uh, Technical Preview. Snap improvements for snapping uh, windows to corners, to quadrants of a screen now instead of just halves. And finally, features carried over from Windows 8 and 8.1. Okay, everybody's been crying about the lack of a start menu, and there's a good reason for the crying because many companies when they write their software, expects you to use the start menu to find the different parts of their software. I'll give you an example. Uh, Quicken, TurboTax. A lot of the, these things, a lot of the software you buy, uh, Adobe um, Premiere, Adobe Photoshop, all these things, soft pieces of software, write little sub-menus inside the start menu. And there's no other easy way for you to get to things. So when Microsoft killed it off in 8 and 8.1, these companies were hung out to dry because now you couldn't get to a lot of the, their functions in their software without fishing around inside the program files and program files 86 inside your uh, win, uh, Windows Explorer or File Explorer. So things got kind of messy. So there was a whole industry of people putting back in start menus. And I, even I got into it and I provide a description of how you can create three start buttons inside the task bar of Windows 8 and 8.1 and they work just fine, okay? You can create start buttons inside Windows 8 and 8.1 and you just have to get used to the fact there's three of them now instead of one start button, okay? <laughs> so anyhow, okay, there are three new buttons I told you about inside Windows uh, Technical Preview the leftmost one is a permanent one you cannot move. It is the new uh, un immovable start button. And then what else can I tell you? If you click on it, there are there's a start menu that now pops up as a default instead of the start screen. And everybody's very happy with that. They, everybody that writes articles has been raving about it. The new start menu looks like this. There are two columns in it. The left column is pretty much the same start menu that you used to see in Windows 7. And 
the right column of the start menu isn't really a column. It just starts out looking like a column. It is, in essence, the entire start screen full of tiles that you can resize. And half of them are live. Live tiles are now part of the start menu. These tiles come from Windows 8 and 8.1. And a lot of people really like them, the newer computer users, because they're easy to see. And it's great for people that have uh, problems hitting extremely and dealing with extremely small icons and fonts in the legacy start menu. So there's something to be said for the new start uh, menu, which is now merged into the start button. In this start menu, um, let's see what else I tell you about. Okay, so we're going to skip through a lot of this. This is simply because I'm running out of time. Um, I talked about that. Um, I was gonna talk. Okay, let's talk first about the leftmost column of the start uh, menu. In the very bottom of the darn thing is all apps. All apps. You click on it, and what happens? You end up with a pile, a list in alphabetical order of everything that's over that used to be in the start screen of Windows 8 and 8.1. Okay? So far, so good. But where's the stuff that you've installed? Well, the software that you've installed is way down at the bottom now. Eventually, they'll either make it so you can change that, or they'll uh, people write utilities to help flip that, or people will get you some registry hacks to flip that, because most of us want to get to our own stuff and not to this newfangled uh, Windows Store app stuff from Windows 8 and 8.1. So if you pull, if you scroll down by dragging downward in the right um, scroll bar of the left portion of the start menu, you eventually get down to your stuff. And you'll notice that in this case, I've installed FileZilla, LibreOffice, and that's all I've installed into this particular computer, example computer. So that's where your stuff will be, way down the bottom of the All Apps button, I guess. <laughs> um, so the other thing that is of great interest is They've improved the sizeability, the, the adjustability of the start menu. If you grab the top of the start menu, you can drag it up and down now from way down low to just about an inch high, all the way up to the top of the, uh, your monitor. So that's helpful. A lot of people have wanted this feature for quite a while. So it's just, you might like it. OK, Windows Store apps now run in the desktop. And that's a good thing. A lot of people have been screaming that they could not resize them. They're used to resizable windows. And now these people get their wish. Um, what else can I tell you about? OK, Windows Store apps are also known as Metro style apps, modern apps, and universal apps. Microsoft's employees have been using more than, obviously, more than one name for these newfangled apps that used to run in the Windows uh, start screen of Windows. 8 and 8.1. What else can I tell you about? OK. In the, um, they also, in addition to running in the desktop, they default to a full size screen, but you can resize them like any regular Windows in the Windows desktop. And so if I s click on News on the right tile, uh, right half of my Start menu, it opens up full screen on the desktop as the news app. And um, when you on the top of this full screen window now is a control uh, title bar. On the left, you have two pull down menus. And on the right, you have the three normal buttons you find on any window. The uh, minimize, restore, and maximize toggle button and then the X button for closing out a window or app. So the middle button will be obviously be, uh, be the restore button to restore the size to a more normal size. And when that you click on it, you get a regular window inside your desktop, which is very handy for people that are used to the desktop of Windows. On the there are two new buttons on the left and bottom of your taskbar inside your uh, desktop, the search button and the task view button.
The search button looks like a magnifying glass, and it lets you search the whole world, including your computer, just your computer, or the entire uh, web of the internet. So that's a global search. This new button looks like two pieces of paper superimposed upon each other, staggered, is the new task view button, task view. And they, these two new buttons cannot be moved or deleted. They are part of your task bar, permanent parts of the new task bar. You can, however, auto-tide your task bar to make a little bit more room on the desktop for you to use. The task view button lets you create virtual desktops. I'll show you how that works. If you have two windows open, one of them could even be um, minimized on your desktop, and you click on the task view button, which is there, You'll, the two windows that are open, whatever their current size are, will be resized to these to politically correct thumbnails. And these thumbnails represent um, things you can do with them. So on the very bottom, you'll find an as, Add a Desktop button. Add a Desktop button. If you click on this bottom plus Add a Desktop button, you will get an additional in the, in the middle an additional thumbnail of a new desktop and this new desktop will have nothing in it and what so the space above the three thumbnails will have nothing in it if you were then to hover your mouse cursor over the thumbnail of the original desktop all the original windows of this desktop will show up above the three thumbnails, then if you were to right click on one of these original windows, you can move one of the original windows on the original desktop to a new virtual desktop. So you can move the windows around between desktops that way. So what else can I tell you about? Um, if you, the taskbar in all of your desktops will be exactly the same. The shortcuts that you have placed on the original desktop uh, of Windows will show up in all of the virtual desktops. The only thing different between the various desktops is what windows are open or minimized in a particular desktop. If you click on a task button um, on your task bar for a window that is actually open in another desktop, the window will open up and become your highlighted uh, active window, and you will be taken to the other desktop, the one that you're not currently on. So that the taskbar lets you jump between windows, but that all automatically will let you also jump you between desktops. So you'll either hate it or you'll love it. It's, it's been a popular feature in both the Linux and Unix world and the Mac world for quite a few years now. If you click on the Add a Desktop rectangle, the little plus inside a circle, you'll create yet another virtual desktop. For most computers, you can create about seven desktops, six in addition to the original desktop. So you can keep clicking on it, and you will end up with more desktops to use. And when you, you can jump between desktops, you could, each desktop could be for a different project you're working on or for different purposes. So anyhow, um, what else can I tell you about? If you close out a desktop, the active windows that reside in that desktop will be pushed to an adjacent desktop. So you, you closing a desktop does not close the windows of that desktop. Okay. So when you click on a virtual desktop after you've activated task view, the desktop becomes like any regular desktop that you own. So it's like having multiple computers or at least multiple monitors. Okay, so anyhow, the next big feature is improved snap and snap assist. In uh, every version of Windows since Vista, 
say Windows 7, 8, and 8.1, you have something called Snap. And what happens in all these versions of Windows, and a lot of this stuff is carried over into Windows 10, if you drag the title bar like this from an existing window to the very top, you will maximize that window. That's true for every version of Windows from 7 through 10. If you, um, so then of course when it's maximized, it looks like that, right? It fills up the whole monitor. If you drag the title bar in Windows 7, 8, and 8.1, and in 10, to the left or right edge of the monitor screen, you will snap and fill up half of the monitor screen. For example, if I drag this title bar to the right side of the monitor, it will fill up the right half of the monitor screen. Okay. Unlike in Windows 7, 8, and 8.1, if you drag the title bar to a corner like this, you will end up with the window filling up the that particular quadrant of your monitor screen. This is new. Okay, and you can do the same thing by holding down the arrows, the Windows key, and using the arrows keys, the four arrow keys. So hold down the Windows key and push the arrow keys to move a window up to the left, to the right, to the corners, or in the case of uh, Windows 10, down to minimize the window. Okay. So what else can I tell you about? In this case, I drag it to the right and I fill up. This is an example of something called arrow, um, called uh, snap assist. If I take a window and I drag it to one of the, either one of the sides or the corner, it will fill up whatever I it thinks it needs to fill up. Snap assist means that right afterwards, to the thumbnails for some of the original windows that you haven't resized will pop up. And these are suggested thumbnails. If you click on one of these thumbnails of these suggested windows, it will then fill up the other half of your monitor screen. Or if you drag it to one of the corners, it'll fill up one of the corners of the one of the quadrants of your monitor screen. Okay. Finally, um, there are features in Windows Technical Preview or Windows 10 that have been carried over from Windows 8.1, and the features that are most uh, noticeable are file history, system image backup, storage spaces, and window, Windows to Go. Windows to Go is only carried over in the Enterprise Edition. File, I have an entire presentation about all these features. I'll be happy to deliver it to you or to your users group. File history is the ability, and you configure it, of Windows 8 through Windows 10 to make static snapshots of a file presentation or document that you're working on um, at regular intervals in time that are determined by you. The shortest interval is every 10 minutes and the longest is something like every four hours. So you can decide how often you want a snapshot made of a file, for example, in my case, a presentation I'm working on, so that you can go back and see what it looked like in the past. So it's very handy, and you have file history need, requires an external hard drive. It doesn't put it on the same hard drive that your C drive is located on. So it gives you some capability to restore from the failure of your C drive where your My Documents and other important uh, files might be probably located. System image backup used to be called Windows Backup and Restore in Windows 7. It became in Windows 8, it, it was renamed to Windows 7 File Recovery. In Windows 8.1, it was renamed to uh, System Image Backup. And in Windows 10, at least the initial preview of it that is available now for everybody for, to, to play with, it is also available as System Image Backup. It makes an image of your C drive and any other internal hard drives that you have so that you can recover from a hard drive failure. And you have, you can then use it for making, doing something called a bare metal restore. It doesn't back up an individual file that has to be done by file history. So the word backup 
may be debatable as to whether that is really a real backup. A lot of people will argue it for hours. Storage spaces is the ability in Windows 8, 8.1, and now in 10 for using to mirror two hard drives. You cannot do it with a C drive, but you can do it with any other drives so that both drives have exactly the same information, files, folders, and other information on them in case one drive fails. I use it extensively and have an entire presentation about it. It is a low cost, no frills, software based RAID 1 or 10. And if those of you who have looked at RAID systems know that when you ha add RAID to a computer motherboard or you add a RAID controller card to a PCIe or PCI bus, it can be a very expensive proposition. The good ones run around 400 to 600 dollars. So this is a very nice feature that's bundled in with Windows uh, 8 and 8.1 and 10 for mirroring hard drives where you don't have to spend any money other than to buy some hard drives. So it's very handy. I have a presentation about it. Windows to go is the ability for you to make a bootable hard drive, uh, a USB hard drive that can be used to boot up any other computer with Windows 10. Uh, so it's a very handy feature for testing and for users groups. If you give me a hard drive, I would gladly give it back to you with a copy of Windows uh, 8, 8.1 or preview of 10 on it and you could use it to boot up any other computer non-destructively. When you attach this hard drive, it would boot up into Windows 10 preview or 8 or 8.1, whatever you want. And if you don't have it attached, it would boot up into your regular operating system, Windows 7, Vista, or XP. So that concludes this presentation. I hope uh, you have some good questions. You can send them to me. Uh, let me go real quickly back. It's very, I usually like to go back to my very first slide so you can write down my email address if you um, get a chance, would like to correspond with me about Windows Preview or Windows 8 the Enterprise Evaluation, which is also free, or Windows 8. Enter, uh, enterprise Evaluation or Windows 7 Enterprise Trial. These are all free versions, time limit versions uh, of Windows that you can use for, at no cost for learning and demonstration purposes. So that concludes our presentation. You've been a great audience. Thank you.